Hi everybody, I'm Scott, and in this video I want to talk about automatic transfer switches. Yeah, even if you're not familiar with this style of automatic transfer switch, which is what I'm primarily going to talk about, you might be familiar with automatic transfer switches as they relate to generators. And the principle is much the same as how those work and these work. So this is the situation where you'd want to have an ETS or automatic transfer switch. You have two different inputs to it, so two different line level voltages, for example, a generator and utility power, or a UPS and another UPS, or utility power and a UPS plus a generator. Depending on your configuration, the power could come in from either one of these two sources, and then the automatic transfer switch will connect one of those at a time to your load. And usually one would be designated as primary, and one would be designated as a secondary. And so the primary would be the one that carries the load whenever it's available. If the primary goes out, then it would disconnect from the primary and connect to the secondary. And then presumably when the primary comes back, then it would reconnect back to the primary. So it would connect to either one of the inputs, but never both at the same time, because that would be disastrous. And it would switch them between the load. And of course, you could have many different loads connected to it. So you could have a circuit breaker panel in the case of a generator, automatic transfer switch, or you could have this thing, which basically serves the same purpose. It has two inputs and then a multitude of outputs, and it will only draw power from one of these inputs at a time. And one of them is designated primary, as you can see from this LED being labeled PRI, and this one being labeled SEC is the secondary, of course. And this automatic transfer switch has a function which not all of them do which is that you can specify which input is the primary input, either A or B. And this one also supports 120 through 230 volts. Well, 240 really, but it says 230, but we'll, we'll ignore that because I, I use these for 240 volts all the time and they work just fine. So I suppose a practical demonstration is in order. Uh, for a previous video, I built a switch box. In fact, this exact switch box which I intended to use to demonstrate the purpose and function of an automatic transfer switch by having two different outputs that were that I could switch on and off to show the power being cut in and out. And unfortunately, I was going to use this with a giant ass 240 volt 30 amp transfer switch, but that switch did not work. And so now I have this box, which I will use for other purposes. So I've kept it, but instead I've created a 120 volt version of that same box. And this is very much the same thing in that there's two different outputs and two receptacles on each this time, but they're both connected to the same output and one switch for each one. So I could turn each set of receptacles on and off independently. And of course, this is just connected to 120 volts on a regular power strip. So both of these are coming from the same source. It's just for the purposes of demonstration, I can show cutting one in and one out. So there's not much to this. I'm gonna hook one of the wires up to there and one of them up to there. Now currently this is set to have the primary input on A. It's upside down but it says A and A is the one on this side so it's AB logically enough. And so that we can see where power is going I have a blue LED light bulb which is now lit up. Hooray! It's now lit up but as you can see the primary is actually shut off right now and the secondary is on. If I turn the primary on, a relay clicks inside and nothing happens with the light bulb because it's just switched over from the secondary back to the primary without really interrupting the current flow to this device. And now if I turn off the secondary power, nothing happens. There's no click of a relay because it's already running off primary, but we can of course switch back. So now it's only running off secondary, primary and secondary. Now, of course, if both go off at the same time, even if a brief interruption happens, it does go off. And then when one of them comes back on, it doesn't matter which one, power will return to the device. Uh, for example, with a whole house generator, that switchover may take a couple of minutes because the generator has to warm up, come up to speed, and be able to provide enough amperage to run the house. So it might be, you know, 10 seconds to a minute before it actually switches over. In this case, this is meant for connection to servers. In fact, it's manufactured by Server Technology Incorporated, and it's called the Fail Safe Transfer Switch TM. And I think this thing dates back quite a few years. It's probably at least 10 years old, if not 20, but it works perfectly. I have a bunch of these actually, and they all work and have worked for a long time. So uh, I would recommend these. 
And the thing about these is they do not interrupt the power for any significant amount of time when, when switching between primary and secondary. And that is exactly what you want if you have a computer hooked up to this, because if the power goes out to the computer for even a second, well, the computer is going to shut down and then restart or just shut down and maybe not come back on with power. So that would obviously be completely undesirable with servers. And so this is meant to solve that problem by transferring the power very quickly. How quickly exactly? Well, we can find out. And for this purpose, I have an oscilloscope. It's a Roda and Schwartz RTB 2004. The model number doesn't really matter, but just in case you were curious. I've also got a little AM probe connector, which uh, converts a standard North American or Chinese, actually in this case, style socket to banana plugs, shrouded banana plugs, uh, optionally. And that is an Amprobe ADPTRSCT socket check adapter. And to plug into that, I have a differential probe. This is uh, MICSIG Mixig. I don't know. A lot of a few different companies have this exact same looking model. So I'm guessing it's just sort of a white label thing. And this is basically a times 50 or times 500 probe. We're going to use it times 50 to measure line voltage. And this just basically keeps the line voltage separate from the output to the oscilloscope. So on the input side, it's got these two shrouded banana plugs. And then the output side, it's got a standard BNC connector to go to the oscilloscope, as well as a USB cord for power, because this box does need its own power. And just real quick to show you what's going on with this, I'm going to plug this directly into mains power. And uh, this is actually a relatively safe way to do this. I've done this in a much more dangerous fashion before. But uh, yeah, having this go into a differential probe, which is, uh, well, it's only CAT2 rated, but relatively safe in this circumstance because we're not putting any load across this. And that rating is probably meaningless anyway. I mean, I don't know if they've actually made it to CAT2 standards. But I plugged it into the USB, and you can see that green LED came on for the times 50, which means this has power. And then I just hooked that up to the oscilloscope. And here is what the power looks like on the scope. And through the magic of connecting it to a computer, we can see it much more clearly right here. And so you see very simple sine wave peaking at about 160 something volts. And it's 117 volts RMS. So which is just about right. Now, of course, we don't just want to measure, you know, straight up line voltage. We want to see how fast this transfer switch transfers. This, on, this transfer switch only has C13 style receptacles. So I'm going to connect to this adapter, which is just a simple North American 15 amp plug to a C14 or C13 connector. I always get those backwards. And then we'll plug the AMP probe test unit with the differential probe into that. So now through all this cabling, the oscilloscope is effectively connected to the transfer switch and the transfer switch has both of its inputs connected to both of these switches here. So right now they're both on. So if we disconnect the primary, that causes a brief interruption to power while it switches over to secondary. And then uh, same thing going back again. So we want to see how long we're actually without power because of course that light bulb that I was using for demonstration purposes before has a capacitor in it. So even with a minor power interruption, this might stay lit, or at least apparently to the human eye, but might actually go out for a brief period of time, you know, a few milliseconds, for example. So for that, I've scaled the scope up to capture a lot more data. Let me get rid of the trigger because we can't really trigger on anything because it's basically just a brief interruption of the sine wave that we're looking for. So I'm going to do a manual trigger and I am going to add some zoom to it so we could zoom in on the portion of the sine wave that is uh, all jacked up from switching over. Okay, and then we can see right about here, the sine wave gets a little messed up and that is where the transfer switch transferred over power. So if we move over to there, oh yeah, we can see that's where the transfer of power happened. And you can see it took a about one power line cycle. So you can see the power uh, immediately gets cut off and then comes back on. I think this is probably the relay bouncing around a little bit, but it's only off for one power line cycle because there's a peak here, then it's off. And then by the time we get back to the next peak, it's back to a normal sine wave thereafter.
So this provides a very brief interruption to power and almost any computer power supply, at least any of the ones that I've tried with one of these ATSs, will survive missing one power line cycle because the power supplies have capacitors for smoothing and for whatever other purposes, and those capacitors will generally take up that little bit of load that's missing from that power line cycle. So most power supplies will have the capacitance in, internally to maintain power on the DC rails through that brief interruption. But any more of an interruption, we might run into a problem, but these transfer switches are pretty good. I think one power line cycle is pretty much what you can ask for out of one of these units. I mean, yeah, in theory it could be less, but in practicality, it has to switch off one relay and switch on another, which is a mechanical action. I'm sure they make solid state versions, but their current handling capacity is probably not as high, and it might have other issues with it. I've only used ones that have relays to do the switching, and those are probably also the cheapest way to do it. But as long as it's switching off for a very brief period of time so that the power supply and the computer, its, its capacitors can pick up the slack, it's more than adequate for the job. And not just computers, by the way, I also have uh, cable modems and other sorts of electronic equipment connected to these, and all of it survives a transfer over from one, pri from the primary to secondary or vice versa. And now, of course, if I start the scope running again, we can do the opposite and see how long it takes to go back to the primary after transferring back from the secondary. And there you go, right over here is where that relay click happened. And so if I go to zoom in on that, you can see again, it, uh, it really messed with the power here, but um, it did miss just about one, a little less than one cycle, because you can see there's a nice neat trough happening here. Although it looks like it starts to switch over here, because there's a little bit of noise in the line. But you can see the power is really only absent from roughly this trough. I don't think this is necessarily full supply current. Like if we actually had a big load connected to this, I don't think you would see that there. But you can see we have the beginnings of the trough right here. And it's actually less than a power line cycle because we have all this before the next trough. So, yeah, um, more than adequate performance, I would say, in both switching from secondary to primary and primary to secondary. Of course, Server Technology Incorporated is not the only company to make a transfer switch for servers and computers and other electronic equipment. Uh, this one, for example, is from Triplight. And in contrast to the one I just showed you, which is a relatively, I would call it dumb automatic transfer switch in that it just transfers from primary to secondary and back to primary when primary is available. This one, however, is programmable and a lot more complicated and has monitoring all via an ethernet interface, which if I could put my finger on it is right there. And it also has a port for environmental monitoring and a port for configuration via serial cable. But conceptually, this is much the same. You can see it only has one wire connected to it right now. However, on the back, this just happens to have the primary input as a hard connection, and then the secondary input is right here. So we can simply connect the cable to that. And now we have two inputs here and here to this automatic transfer switch. In case you're wondering why these are like aftermarket plugs, it's because this originally is was a, well, it's not originally, it was and is a 20 amp switch. You can see it has 20 amp receptacles on it. And the problem with that is I didn't always have a UPS that I wanted to plug this into that had a 20 amp receptacle on it. So I put 15 amp receptacles on it, which is uh, perfectly fine as long as the load on this doesn't exceed 15 amps or the rating of the UPS, then uh, that's not an issue. It just so happens that this automatic transfer switch has receptacles on the back, uh, two, four, six, eight of them. And likewise has eight receptacles on the front. And that's just for flexibility. Of course, you can connect them stuff to either side of it, but this also has a party piece in that it can sequence power to the devices. Because for example, when you're transferring load from one source to another, you might not want to transfer that entire load, boom, all at once. For example, if you're drawing, let's say this is capable of 20 amps, if you're drawing a full 20 amps, the surge current when you switch over might be a little too much for a UPS or another device or even a small generator to handle. So this has this capability of sequencing the load on and, sequence, and also sequencing the load off when power is lost on one of the inputs.
And this is a fairly old unit. I think this dates back to around the 2006, 2008 era, um, which is not tremendously old and still works great, so there's no problem with it. But to show you what I mean, let's take a quick look at its web interface, which it does have. Now, just for fun, uh, here is what comes up when you have a serial cable connected to it. And it is a bit slow to initialize. You can see this is actually from 2009, this particular unit, copyright trip light 2007, or at least 2009 was when the latest firmware was installed on this. Um, but probably at earliest, this is from 2007. And here is where you can configure these various parameters if uh, they're not set to your desire, which they are right now for me. I'm just going to have it hooked uh, using DHCP. And there we go. The HTTP server daemon is running and it's now initializing. So we should be able to get to the web interface. And indeed we can. The default username and password are both admin. And here you can see a bench of monitoring stuff on the input and the output. And of course, this is very like old school website type stuff. Uh, copyright 2005, 2007 trip light. So you know what kind of stuff we're dealing with here. This can be connected to a UPS for battery monitoring. Well, not for battery monitoring, but it can do battery monitoring and other, uh, here's some other miscellaneous information. And one cool thing is that using this, you can remotely power up and power down each individual receptacle. So you can see there are 16 of them total. That was eight on the front, eight on the back. And you can turn them all on or off independently or just power cycle them if you want to reset a server, um, hard reset or whatever. You can also reboot the UPS if you have one connected. Um, start shed sequence, which sheds the loads. Ramp sequence, which ramps up the loads, like turning on one receptacle at a time and a bunch of other stuff you can see there. And then in settings, we have some basic information about the device, but here's also where it's interesting, is that you can, as it says, RAM settings enable the selected outlets loads to turn on after delay when primary power is applied or restored. So right now I have them set to turn on after a delay of zero seconds, but you can have them remain off or turn, off at, turn on after a delay of, well, any number of seconds you want. And same with shedding, Shed settings enable the selected outlet's loads to turn off after delay when the primary power is lost. That's after it switches to secondary. So for example, if you have a large ass UPS on the primary and maybe a small UPS in the secondary and you know that it's not gonna last very long, you could have it gradually shed the power and maybe keep your most essential servers on last and maybe for longest and then hope that primary power comes back before that. But very cool stuff. It also has internal event logging. You could SN SNMP log or trap it's pretty cool it's old old school but it has a lot of settings you can also have it set send emails when certain events happen and of course have the network the web server and blah 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 all the kind of usual stuff you'd expect in a device like this um, including ntp uh, synchronization and of course you can have a look at the logs you might be asking well why are we using a device from 2005 2007 um, well because it's cheap it may not be ideal. There are probably plenty of better ATSs out there nowadays with better software and more functionality. But I think this device was about a hundred bucks when I got it. And I think brand new, these go for like a thousand or over a thousand. Yeah. Which is not an amount I'm prepared to spend on an automatic transfer switch for my eBay bought servers that were all relatively cheap back there. And of course, uh, APC makes automatic transfer switches. I have a couple back there from Baytech. Um, if you search for them on eBay, you can find a whole variety of different types, sizes, brands, and, um, well, prices. But at the base of it all, their functionality is the same. The, their job is to transfer power from a primary input to a secondary input, and then perhaps back to a primary. Some of them will stick to the secondary. It'll switch to the last input that was available. So it might stay on the secondary. If it switches to the secondary, that's what my Baytex switches back there do. Although I think they are configurable. I don't know how to configure them. Yeah, it's not obvious. It's not like switches on the back, which control that kind of stuff. And so now you might be asking, well, from a practical standpoint, how and why would I use one of these? Well, let me show you. So here's an example that you might have in a typical home lab. You might have two UPSs, a server with a single power supply or a workstation for that matter, 
which you plug into the automatic transfer switch. And now you have the benefit, well, you have two benefits. One is that you basically have doubled your runtime. So if this UPS, let's say, and let's say these UPSs are the same size, this one's actually a bit smaller, but these are just what I had handy. Let's say this UPS's runtime was 20 minutes on whatever load this is, and this UPS's runtime is also 20 minutes. Well, now you have 40 minutes of runtime because when this UPS dies, it'll switch the load over to this one. Well, or vice versa, depending on which one's primary. The other benefit is that if you need to take a UPS offline for whatever reason, for example, let's say you want to change the batteries on a UPS, you don't have to shut down your server. You can simply power off the UPS and the load switched over to the other UPS. And there you saw the bulb blink, which is kind of weird. I don't know, we didn't see that kind of timing earlier, but uh, well, that's a bit unusual. I'm not sure why that is, but you can see the load is now on this UPS. Not that it's showing much in the way of load, but there it is. And then when we replace the batteries, turn this UPS back on, the, light, the LED came on for primary. I heard the relays click and the light bulb was still on. And now the load is on this UPS. And likewise, we can now turn this one off. And for example, do maintenance on this UPS. And it also protects you in the event that UPS dies. I mean, especially with these like cyber power, like the cheaper APC or trip light UPSs, I've had these die on me where they just stop providing power completely. Not just where they die, where they don't provide power when on battery, but I mean like even when plugged in, they'll just suddenly stop providing power. And so with an ATS, you protect yourself against that. And then you may say, well, Scott, that's all well and good, but what if I have an ATS that goes bad? That's a single point of failure, isn't it? Well, sure, these can fail as well. So in some situations, it might pay to have two automatic transfer switches in a case where a server might have two power supplies. And I was too lazy to bring out a full server with two power supplies, so just here's two server power supplies. Imagine that they're in a full-size server. And ultimately, for redundancy, resiliency, nothing beats having servers with two or more power supplies because, of course, then you can, even without automatic transfer switches, share the load amongst two UPSs, or in the case, and this is how I do it in my basement here, I would actually connect each of these automatic transfer switches to two different UPSs. So I'd have four UPSs connecting ultimately to one server with two power supplies. So that this way, if even three UPSs die at once, which of course wouldn't happen, but let's say I want to reconfigure that I might want to bring down three of them at once. But more importantly, I've quadrupled my capacity on those UPSs, assuming they're all the same which they are capacity-wise. And so my runtime is even longer than it would otherwise be. And of course I have the redundancy of having two automatic transfer switches for UPSs. I mean, it's kind of nuts. I don't necessarily recommend you go that far, but you can and I do. And it's uh, both for fun and, and, and uh, practical purposes. So yeah, that is why I would recommend an automatic transfer switch I just tried to turn this light bulb off, forgetting that this is actually connected to UPSs right now. So uh, that's not actually going to shut off. So would I recommend you run out and get an automatic transfer switch tomorrow? Well, maybe. I mean, if you see the benefit of sharing, well, not sharing the load, but having the load shed from one UPS to another and having the availability of taking a UPS offline, for example, or you could even just have, if you only have one UPS, have the automatic transfer switch connected to the UPS and to line input just directly to a wall outlet. And then you can still take your UPS offline for maintenance, or you can disconnect things and move things around without actually having to take your server or servers offline. So if you have a small home lab, even if you just have one server at home, that's very important that you want to keep up and running and you have, you know, power failures every now and then. Yeah, I would recommend one. You can find them pretty cheap. Um, I would say a hundred dollars is probably sort of a target price for a decent one but you can get them for a lot more and a little bit less. But of course you want to make sure you get one that's guaranteed to be working. Um, I wouldn't get one untested or for parts or repair. That's what screwed me over on the 30 amp 240 volt one that I was going to show originally for this demonstration. Although come to think of it, um, it would have been hard to demonstrate with my giant ass 240 volt 30 amp UPSs. So these are a lot more convenient. So kind of glad I went the 120 volt route for this demonstration, but uh, yeah. Thanks for watching. Uh, don't forget to, I forgot what you're not supposed to forget to. Oh, um, like and subscribe to the video and, and so forth. Um, yeah. Thanks in advance.
if you do it. If you don't do it, I don't mind either. Um, it's completely up to you. Yeah. Video.